Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, permanent representatives, ladies and gentlemen, exactly one year ago, I launched a call of action to reaffirm the fact that human rights lie at the very heart of our mission and to place human dignity at the very heart of our work. In an echo of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I reaffirmed in this call to action that uh, basic freedoms uh, were the highest aspiration of humanity and that human rights uh, are the best way to help societies achieve prosperity and full respect for freedom and prosperity. All members of the human family, for all members of hu the human family to be free to speak, believe, free of terror and free of misery. The best way to achieve the sustainable development goals, uh, to prevent conflict, uh, to uh, reduce human suffering, and to build a fair and equitable world, to guarantee r equality for women and girls, to combat racism and discrimination to protect minorities, indigenous peoples, uh, journalists, and human rights activists, to uh, uh, achieve uh, climate and nature justice, and uh, to uh, ensure that there be justice in the digital world. The call for action was launched last year in uh, um, a context of, gen of widespread human rights violations worldwide, egregious violations, uh, insidious transgressions. Uh, we have seen human rights trampled upon and assaulted since the launch of the appeal. Our world has uh, endured the greatest crisis in generations. Devastation and suffering wrought by the, human, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has afflicted all of society, and the health crisis quickly morphed into an economic crisis, a humanitarian crisis, and a human rights crisis. The pandemic has uh, uh, undermined economic, social, cultural, civil, and political rights in all regions. Uh, and once again, revealing the uh, fact that they are deeply entwined rights and protection systems have been weakened, have been tested, and at times, and in some areas, have been broken. Women minorities, the elderly, in individuals with disabilities, indigenous peoples, and others have suffered disproportionately. We have also borne witness uh, with the pretext of the pandemic being used, the proliferation of uh, security and authoritarian security and emergency measures uh, to repress dissonant dissent and to trample upon basic freedoms, uh, to muzzle independent media, and to uh, uh, create restrictions in civic space. These discriminations and inequalities have been unmasked. Uh, uh, health systems have been insufficient. Protections have been insufficient. Structural inequalities have been revealed. And there has been uh, setbacks. There have been setbacks in gender equality. And the environment has been tested. And the climate crisis has been made all the more evident. We have a historic, unique opportunity to build a world where the dignity of each individual is acknowledged, where each society is in a position and capable to resist crisis, where the future of each individual is based upon the bedrock of individual and inalienable rights. Uh, the Call of Action for Human Rights incorporates the most urgent, the most fundamental issues plaguing our world in view of ensuring rights be upheld. And there is a need for us to give the very best of ourselves uh, to that end. Uh, the, the, there is a need to ad address this in, in thematic ways, uh, uh, the path to sustainable development, rights in periods of crisis, gender equality, and uh, equality of rights for women, civic participation, civic space, the rights of a future generation, specifically to a free, clean, safe environment, guarantees of a secure digital world, and lastly, collective action. The union of our efforts to achieve those goals for is, uh, is necessary to become a reality. To mark our 75th anniversary, we conducted a global survey asking people around the world to identify a top priority for the United Nations going forward. A vast number replied with two words, human rights. They want strengthened national human rights instruments to address systemic racism, address political and religious persecution, 
ensure equal rights for women, and protect indigenous peoples and members of the LGBTQ community. They want to end discrimination and harassment once and for all. And they want corporate accountability and human rights protections that respond to the rapid advances of our digital world. With your support over the last year, the call to action is making important progress. The United Nations family is working together to ensure that human rights are at the heart of the COVID-19 socioeconomic response plans. In the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, we rapidly issued a number of policy briefs focusing the global spotlight on pathways for action in vital areas, including rights and opportunities for persons with disabilities, older persons, women, children, refugees and migrants, and indigenous peoples, always in a human rights perspective minded. Other policy briefs thoroughly explored pressing issues such as the full scope of human rights challenges in the COVID era, as well as the importance of food security and nutrition. We accelerated our work to help member states implement the global compacts on refugees and for safe, regular and orderly migration, a central human rights question. We are leading an initiative to help governments dismantle outdated discriminatory laws against women and reinvigorating the use of temporary special measures to accelerate gender parity. We adopted the first ever system-wide guidance to help protect and promote civic space, both offline and online. We are strengthening UN leadership on human rights on the ground and have already seen a concrete and concrete impact with our country teams engaging with governments and societies on a wide range of human rights issues and with success. For instance, resident coordinators in a number of countries have established dialogues to bring in the voices and views of civil society in discussions over new measures that might risk civic space and create undue burdens on NGOs. We are engaging more and more young people and children in the global human rights conversation and decision making, including on climate action. So crucial it is to advancing intergenerational justice. Building on the youth climate movement, I launched my youth advisory group on climate change to amplify youth voices and draw on the energy and ideas of young people as we work to raise ambition and accelerate action to tackle the climate emergency. We are developing a plan of action to protect environmental human rights defenders who have sadly often been victims of violence and abuse. And we are making headway for an agenda for protection to help ensure a rapid coordinated UN effort to support those at risk. We will soon launch the system-wide guidance on human rights due diligence for the development and use of technology informed by a broad spectrum of actors. And we are advancing our efforts to implement the plan of action on hate speech and the initiative to safeguard religious sites. We are focusing on peace building work, on the nexus between peace building and human rights, including through initiatives that protect women and youth peace builders and human rights defenders. We will launch a first of its kind one stop digital shop bringing together a wealth of resources on implementing human rights in the digital space. And we issued new guidance to our country teams to further support member states throughout the universal periodic review process, including in implementing the recommendations. Excellencies, this is just the beginning. Our enduring challenge is to transform the promise of the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into real-world change on the ground. It is to look at our contemporary challenges with a human rights lens. And this is why my call to action extends beyond the UN family. It is also a call to all member states, to parliamentarians, to the business community, to civil society, and to people everywhere. We shoulder a collective responsibility. Transformative change will take the full commitment and support of us all. And of course, it will take resources. While our budget proposals for human rights activities have grown in recent years, across the board budget cuts approved by member states have reduced the final resource levels for human rights action. Additionally, like with other areas of our work, 
The financial crisis has impacted our ability to fully implement our mandates and affected our support to the treaty body mechanisms. I appeal to all member states to ensure that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the treaty body mechanisms and other critical human rights activities have the necessary resources to carry on this mandate and to fulfill our shared promise to protect and advance human rights. Much like COVID-19 vaccines, human rights will not lead to a healthier world if they are only available to the privileged few. We need renewed, concerted, global determination to ensure the protection of human rights of all people, everywhere and in all situations. And we must all join forces to deliver. Only by working together can we forge a new social contract that reflects respect and protection for all people and is rooted in universal human rights. As we enter the second year of the call to action, I look forward to working closely with all of you to fulfill the highest aspirations of the people of the world, human rights and dignity for all. Thank you.